At the beginning of the year, I began a short series of messages with you on the theme of Jesus, he's worth it. And we've been looking together at Jesus from a different Since the beginning of the year, in a series of messages on the overall theme, Jesus, he's worth it, we've been looking at Jesus from a number of different angles. We began by thinking about Jesus as an example worth following. At its simplest, taking Jesus as our example means imitating him so far as we can in our daily living. It means asking in all the complex and frustrating and sad and challenging circumstances we find ourselves, what would Jesus do? When temptations come, asking what Jesus do would do can help us to do the strong thing rather than the wrong thing. Emma was hurrying to a friend's house to chill out. She'd had her school exams and they were finished and she was glad that they were over and that she could have some time with her friends. On the way, she noticed an old lady on the other side of the street struggling with her shopping bags. The old lady was having to stop every few steps to catch her breath and she was really struggling. Emma's embroidered wristband had the initials WWJD on it. What would Jesus do? She asked herself that question. The story of the prodigal son came into her mind and so she went across and though it turned out that the lady lived three streets away and could only walk very slowly, Emma took her shopping bags home for her and made sure she was okay before leaving again. To every Christian, Jesus is an example worth following. Next, we thought about Jesus as a teacher worth listening to. But what does listening to Jesus mean? Listening to Jesus means letting his teachings form and shape our minds and our thinking about life and relationships, about our attitudes and conduct, about religion and God. And this not accidentally or casually, but intentionally, deliberately, constantly. Listening to Jesus means letting his teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, soak into the heart of our being. As long as a tea bag remains by itself outside the cup, it remains inert. But drop that tea bag into a cup of boiling water and slowly but surely it will infuse every single drop until the cup's no longer a cup of water but now a cup of tea. Listening to Jesus as the teacher means letting Jesus' teachings permeate us until we are changed by degrees becoming more like him in our lives. In our third service, we were thinking about Jesus as a saviour worth receiving. He did not come to judge the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek, it was to save he came. And when we call him saviour, and when we call him saviour, and when we call him saviour, then we call him by his name. A month ago we were thinking about Jesus as a master worth serving and now today our focus in this final message in the series is on Jesus as a friend worth having. At every age and stage of life friendship matters. Even as little children when we were very small most of us already realised that to have a special friend was very important to us. Brothers and sisters mattered, of course, but having a friend of our own mattered too. And so our favourite teddy bear or cuddly dog or doll or soft toy went everywhere with us throughout the day and was tucked into bed beside us at night. 
how many of us were inseparable from our comfort blankets. And sometimes these friends of the, our earliest years were even imaginary ones. In her early years, my younger daughter, Anna, had as her constant companion a mythical horse from which she was entirely inseparable. She groomed him and fed him. She spoke to him constantly. And when we went to the seaside for a walk, she invariably rode him along the sandy beach. She's a GP in Denny now and counts Jesus Christ as one of her best friends. But Jesus isn't imaginary. Our need for friends continues as we grow older. Most of us can probably remember many of the friends of our teenage years still, however old we are. And in our later years, the friends we have are precious and should never be taken for granted. I like the quotation from, quotation from Pietro Aretino in the 16th century concerning friendship. He says this, I keep my friends as misers do their treasure. Because of all things granted us by wisdom, none is greater or better than a friend. But of course today our theme isn't friendship in general, but very specifically the friendship of Jesus Christ. Though in the Bible Jesus refers to the disciples and all who obey him as his friends, it's interesting that the disciples never speak about Jesus as their friend or call him their friend. Yet it's abundantly clear if you read the Gospels that in every respect for loyalty and love and closeness of relation and confidence and devotion, the disciples enjoyed a constant, deep and enduring friendship with their master. Jesus Christ was their closest friend. So why does the New Testament never represent the disciples as calling Jesus their friend? Well, perhaps it's because describing Jesus as the friend of the Twelve would exclusivise his friendship, implying in some way that he was only a friend to those who followed him or to those who were friends to him. Whereas in his ministry, as we know because his critics often accused him of it, Jesus Christ was a friend to rejects and reprobates. His arms were wide enough to embrace everyone, and especially in his ministry, those thought of as sinners. In what ways then is Jesus Christ a friend worth having today? Well, the first point may seem obvious, but it's also the most important one. Jesus is not a dead friend, but rather a living one. Read the Bible for yourself and you will discover that the first Christians didn't speak about Jesus in the past tense, despite the fact that he had been put to death. They thought of him and spoke of him and understood him less as someone who had once lived but was now dead than as someone who once died but was now very much and always alive. Every Easter we remind ourselves of this, of course. The tomb is empty and Jesus is no longer present just in one place at one time, but in all places at all times. And Jesus is no longer confined to the past, to history, but waiting to meet us on our future path and ready already to meet you there. Jesus Christ is not a dead friend, but a living one. The second point is this, that Jesus Christ has a deep and disinterested interest in you. Let me explain what I mean by a disinterested interest. Some type of, sometimes people can be friends with us because it suits them, because of some advantage that they might gain from our friendship. This is a particular and obvious problem for people who are wealthy, people with the right connections and people who are celebrities. A fly on the wall at any celebrity 
or royal reception, a fly on the wall at any gathering of the great and the good occupies an advantageous position, because from above it can watch the tactical manoeuvring and engineering of conversations and position that takes place in the frequent and often vain attempts that people at such gatherings make to rub shoulders with the right people. In friendships, people's motives aren't always sincere or clear. People can make friends with us for selfish reasons, because of what they're wanting from us, an introduction to some person or circle, membership of some club, or a favour that they think they might gain as a result of being friends with us. Remember the experience of the prodigal son in Luke's Gospel. While he had plenty of money and was throwing parties every night, he had no lack of friends. But when the money ran out and the fun stopped, his friends melted away. When I declared that Jesus has a disinterested interest in you, what I meant was this, that the friendship of Jesus Christ, the friendship he offers you, is a pure friendship, unsullied by base motive or hidden intention. Jesus Christ has a deep and disinterested interest in you. He will never use, or for that matter, abuse his friendship with you. He is a true friend indeed. In it, not for what he can get out of it, but in it, to offer all that you want and need in a friend. Thirdly, Jesus, as a friend, sees beyond our problems to our potential. Others may look at you and see only your problems. But when Jesus Christ looks at you, it isn't your problems he sees, but your potential. He sees the person you are, but sees at the same time the person God made you to be. This comes out in the Gospels, in Jesus' conversation with Simon Peter, when Simon first met and began to follow Jesus. You are Simon, Jesus told him, but you will be Cephas, Peter, a name meaning the rock. You are and you will be. Jesus sees beyond our demerits to our destiny. You are and you will be. He's fully aware of who you are and what you are as a sinner, of course, but he respects your dignity as an individual made in the image of God. He sees you as you are meant to be and as you were made to be. And he wants to be in your life as a close friend as well as your saviour to help you as an individual to reach the potential that without his help you can only dream about but never realise. You are and you will be. Why is Jesus a friend worth having? First, he is a living friend. Second, because he has a deep and disinterested interest in you. Third, because he sees beyond your problems, whatever they may be, to your potential. And also, fourthly, because he is a faithful friend. It is perhaps a reflection of the frailty of human friendships that the Faithful Friends website on the internet is devoted not to human beings but to animals, to pets and especially to dogs. Who amongst us hasn't been let down or wounded deeply by a so-called friend? Perhaps they have spoken words that have hurt us, or they've distanced themselves from us just when we needed them, or failed us in some time of great difficulty. Yet Jesus Christ is different. He won't desert us in our times of greatest need. Quite the opposite. It's in our times of greatest need that Jesus Christ often comes to us. Just as he came in the Gospels to the Twelve on the lake, walking across the waters when the darkness was the deepest 
and the storm was at its very worst. Then he came to them. We read in the Gospels of a time when Jesus' disciples deserted him. But nowhere do we read that he deserted them. He was with them and he was for them from the beginning and to the end, and entirely. As much more perhaps with them and for them in the bad times than in the good. Researching the subject of friendship, I came across this description of a true friend. It's not by someone as far as I know who had any religious interests, let alone a Christian. But it made me think very much about the friendship of Jesus Christ. This was what they said. A true friend is someone who believes in you when you have ceased to believe in yourself. I really like that. And that's just the kind of friend that Jesus Christ is and the kind of friendship that Jesus Christ offers. We often talk about us believing in him, yet surely it's just as important for us always to remember that he also believes in us, even when others have given up on us and even when we no longer even believe in ourselves. The Bible tells us that even if we are faithless and break our trust, he remains faithful because he is faithful and cannot deny his own nature. We're not exempt from trouble in this world. Public griefs and private trials will come our way. In the world you will have tribulation, Jesus once said. All of us have our own crosses to bear. But as Simon from Cyrene, in an act of friendship, once carried Jesus' cross for him at Easter time, so now Jesus, our friend, is willing to carry ours for us. With Jesus as a friend, the cross is lighter, the way is brighter, and the thorns lose their sting. As the old saying in the book of Proverbs puts it, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now there is one other aspect of the friendship of Jesus that makes it unique. In life, friendships are severed in all sorts of ways. Sometimes, to be sure, it's because of a disagreement or falling out over some matter of hurt or offence. But just as often, it's that as we grow up, our friends may naturally change. Many friendships simply run their course through our lives. Friendships are severed in all sorts of ways, and not least by death. In every earthly friendship, you see, be it ever so close and enduring, there comes an inevitable parting of the ways or separation. It is with Jesus alone that the friendship extends beyond time and space and into eternity itself. For Jesus Christ is not only a living friend and a faithful friend, but an everlasting friend. I wonder if any of you know the old hymn, written by an Edinburgh-born and Royal High School educated 19th century free church minister in his manse at Bervey near Montrose. He gave it the title Jesus the Friend. Here it is. I found a friend, O oh, such a friend, he loved me ere I knew him. He drew me with the cords of love, and thus he bound me to him. And round my heart still closely twine those ties which not can sever, for I am his and he is mine, forever and forever. I found a friend, oh such a friend, he bled and died to save me. And not alone the gift of life, but his own self he gave me. Not that I have mine own I call, I'll hold it for the giver. My heart, my strength, my life, my all, are his and his forever. I have found a friend, oh, such a friend, so kind and true and tender, so wise and a counsellor and guide, so mighty a defender. 
from him who loves me now so well, what power my soul can sever, shall life or death, shall earth or hell, no, I am his for ever. God bless you.